I want to encourage you now to open your Bible to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. We'll be there in just a moment as we begin our, our study. Joshua, chapter 24. So good to see everybody uh, this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Good to have the Lord's house full. So thankful for the presence of each and every one, especially those who are visiting with us. We're so thankful that you have come our way. <clears throat> Sitting in the pew, I'm, I'm very thankful for the men who have led us in our worship today. Our song leading has been very uplifting, well-worded prayers. Brother Wood, I appreciate so much the comments that you made at the table a few moments ago as we were taking our minds and hearts back to that prayer in the garden, back to our Lord's crucifixion. Now we have an opportunity, a peaceful setting in which we can open up God's Word and consider a portion of its meaning, its application to our lives today. <clears throat> Sermons come from all different kinds of places. Uh, sermon ideas pop up here and there. This past Monday, I was listening to a recording of Brother Don Wright, who preaches for the Brown Street Church in Akron, listening to him preach a sermon, and he made a comment about famous last words, and I, I, that got my attention, and I, and I started going this direction while he kept preaching and going this direction. And that's just the way things happen sometimes. That's where this sermon idea has come from, famous last words. Now that is an idiom that we use in our English language. It is a figure of speech. It's when someone makes a statement that is quickly shown to be wrong and oftentimes in a very embarrassing way. It is a comment or prediction that is expected to be proven incorrect, a claim that is quickly contradicted. We use this figure a lot today, famous last words. It's believed that the phrase was initially used to refer to the actual dying words of U.S. Civil War General John Sedgwick. Right before he was shot dead by a sniper, he'd sarcastically said, they couldn't hit an elephant from this distance. Famous last words. And that's how we often use the phrase today. But, but what I want to do, I want us to think for just a moment. If a person knows that this is the last opportunity that they're going to have to say something to someone that they care about or people that they love, don't you think that those words are going to be worth remembering? Those words are going to be worth listening to. Those words are going to be worth hearing. And those words are going to be worth remembering. The Bible is full of such last words. Think about Genesis chapter 49. That entire chapter is Jacob calling his sons to his bed and giving them a blessing before he turns around and dies. Those were his last words. And they took those words very importantly. Uh, Acts chapter 20, when the Apostle Paul calls for the elders of the church in Ephesus, as far as he knows, this is the last time he's going to see them. And so as we read through that chapter, we, we read the, the urgency in his voice as he talks with these elders one last time about their charge to oversee the church there. So, last words that are given by individuals, when they know this is the last opportunity, oftentimes they are worth remembering, worth listening to, worth remembering. What I want to do today, I want to take five men from the Bible, and I want to consider their last words. And I want us to consider some important lessons we need to learn from these famous last words. As you can tell, the first one we're going to is Joshua. In Joshua chapter 24, uh, this general is giving his farewell address to this nation that he has led. It has been under his leadership that they have gone in, conquered, and occupied the promised land. I want to start reading in verse 14. Uh, Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Joshua says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. 
And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This generation that Joshua was talking to, they left Egypt as children or as teenagers. They watched their parents die in the wilderness. They went in and they occupied this promised land. This generation, they had a knowledge of the gods back in Egypt. They apparently had a knowledge of the gods back in Ur of Chaldees. And unfortunately, we know they had not been successful in driving out all of the Canaanites, so their idols remained in the land. There was a real danger of these people falling into idolatry. To continue to enjoy the blessings and privileges of God's covenant, they would have to remain loyal to God. And that would require them each to make a personal commitment to God. And that's exactly what Joshua is doing in this farewell address, calling upon them to choose. Whichever choice they make, they needed to make a choice of, who God, of which God they were going to serve, and they needed to stick with that choice. And then he offers himself up as the right example to follow. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now here's the right choice to make. But regardless of what choice you make, here's the choice that I have made. It is important that our family make a commitment to serving God together. Parents are charged by God to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And so we understand that, that as a family, we need to be worshiping God. And as leaders of the family, we have an obligation, a responsibility by God to, to lead our families in serving the Lord. But I want you to notice here, it starts with me. It starts with me choosing to serve the Lord. I cannot call, and you cannot call, and, and we cannot expect anyone else to serve the Lord if we aren't willing to serve the Lord ourselves. So it starts there. I have to make this decision. I have to make this commitment to serve the Lord. Do as I say, and not as I do, is not how you instill faith in your children and grand grandchildren, is it? No. We lead by example. And so we have to choose to serve the Lord. A lot more can be said about bringing up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I wanted us to stop here on our journey, and I wanted us to consider that what was important to Joshua, what his final words were, he wanted to make sure the next generation was committed to serving God. That's what was important to Joshua, and those were his famous last words. Choose to serve the Lord. Let's go on to another individual who should have our attention. David is the man after God's own heart. And so his final words, we, we should want to hear those. Uh, David has a large place in the Old Testament. Uh, the historical books, First and Second Samuel, First Kings, First Chronicles talk about the life of David. The Psalms, many of those Psalms are written by David. He's mentioned after that. Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, he's mentioned a number of times in the New Testament. David should get our attention. What about his last words? Well, here in the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9, these are words that, Saul, uh, that David is giving to his son Solomon. But he's giving these words to his son Solomon in the hearing of all of the leaders of Israel. You see, the, the torch was being passed. The mantle of leadership was being passed on from a king to his heir. And it was going to be completely different than when David took the throne. Because that came as a result of bloodshed. And that's how a lot of... A lot of Thrones, occupants of thrones changed hands in ancient days. It was through bloodshed. No, this was going to be peaceful. And he wanted to make sure that it was known by all of Israel that Solomon was the son who was going to occupy his throne. 
So he made that clear to all, and then he turns his attention directly to Solomon. And here are some famous last words given to his son Solomon. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. What's the instruction found here? Well, first, know the God of your father. Here's the first thing, Solomon. You make sure you know God. What does it mean to know God? Well, obviously it means to have an intellectual understanding of who God is. You need to know about the character of God. You need to know the things that make him angry and how he responds in anger. David learned that the hard way. But you need also to know about his love. You need to know about his mercy and his patience. You need to know how he deals with mankind. And Solomon, you need to know what his will for your life is. So knowing God, it refers to an intellectual knowledge of God, but it goes much deeper than that, we know. It means to have a relationship with God. You need to know God on that level. As James puts it in James chapter 4 and at verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And James is echoing in that passage what David says here, if you seek him, he will be found by you. Draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. So we need to know God intellectually, but we need to know God personally as well. But also, we are to serve Him. We are to serve God. We are to give our life in service unto Him. Solomon, you're going to be a king. You're going to be a very busy man, but not too busy to not serve God. We need to serve God. And we need to serve Him loyally. That is, with a loyal heart. We need to serve Him wholeheartedly. As Jesus would later say in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll love the one and hate the other. He'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, Jesus says, but you could replace that with anything. You can't divide up your loyalty between God and anything else. So serve God loyally and serve God willingly. Serve Him with a willing mind. You know, it's not out of place. It's not out of place for someone who first comes to God, first becomes a Christian, is baptized into Christ to do so out of fear. They don't want to go to hell when they die. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's legitimate. But that relationship with God should very soon grow to where it's not done out of fear or dread, but service is rendered out of love. And it's no longer a matter of, I've got to do this, but it's now, I want to do this. Serve God willingly. Serve God because you want to, not because you have to. And Solomon, you need to seek God. What does it mean to seek God? Well, in the context here, it would be just the opposite of forsake, wouldn't it? Because that's, what's, that's the opposing actions here. To forsake means to abandon, to turn your back on. So don't turn your back on God, but instead, go towards God. Pursue God. Put your life in the direction of God. Actively pursue Him. In the book of Jeremiah, at chapter 23 and verse 23, Jeremiah 23, and at verse 23, as God is speaking through the prophet, He's challenging the people of Israel to, to come back to him, to repent. And he, he says, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Well, God can be easily found if we would just take that step in seeking for him. He wants to be found by us. As Paul told the philosophers and idolaters in Athens in Acts chapter 17, as he was preaching to them about the true 
the unknown God, the true and living God. He says in verse 27, Acts 17 verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. We are to seek the Lord. We are to pursue the Lord actively and diligently. And the promise is, if you seek Him, He will be found by you. Wouldn't you like to spend your time endeavoring in something that you knew was going to be worthwhile? Anytime we spend seeking God, we're going to find what we're looking for. We're going to find God. Here's the thing, though, about seeking God. God will not force Himself on any of us but He makes Himself available to every one of us. God won't force Himself on you, but He's there waiting for you if you will seek Him. What was important to David? What, what was his last words given to his son? What was important to David was making sure that his son had a right relationship with God. That's what was important to David. Let's go to the New Testament. And let's consider the Apostle Peter. The last two verses in the book of 2 Peter, the last book we have from Peter, and the last two verses of the last book, we could call his famous last words. Peter writes, You therefore, beloved, <clears throat> since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The epistle of 2 Peter as a whole was written to warn and to equip Christians against the threat of false teachers. The false teachers themselves are exposed in great detail in chapters 2 and 3. But before Peter even begins talking about the false teachers... He begins with some practical admonitions that are going to help these Christians to survive the threat of false teachers. Chapter 1 can be broken down this way. It starts with the affirmation that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Chapter 1 and verse 3. What does that mean? That means these false teachers who are coming in and bringing in new ideas, you don't need those. You already have everything that you need from God. But be diligent to develop your faith, verses 5 through 7. With all diligence, add virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and on down that list. You need to develop your faith because doing so will allow you, will give you an abundant entrance into heaven, verses 8 through 11. Failing to do so, you'll be short-sighted, even the blindness but if you grow and develop your faith, the gates of heaven are wide open for you. You will not stumble. Then in verses 12 through 15, Peter says, I am diligent to remind you of these truths. So he's, pre he's presented these truths to them. They've been taught before. He says, I'm not like these false teachers bringing in these new ideas. I'm going to remind you of what you already have. And then, verses 16 through 21, I want you to know that what you have is the truth. Now that's the way chapter 1 breaks down. And what Peter is telling these Christians and telling us today is you already have what you need to withstand the threat of false teachers. Use it. Use it. So we get to the end of the book. Here's the threat of the false teachers, and the threat is real. So beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. How can we avoid that? How can we keep that from happening? Grow. Be diligent to add your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. Grow. Spiritual growth is the effective safeguard against falling away. If you're not growing as a Christian, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're going backwards. You're dying. And the important thing is that we equip ourselves so that we can remain faithful as a congregation and individually as Christians. You know, the church here at Knollwood, we place a great premium on the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Always have, always will. 
The churches in the community, they can offer whatever it is that they want to offer. That's their business, not ours. We're going to follow the pattern we have in the New Testament. And what's important is that we be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now very quickly, how does that work, the grace and knowledge? Well, as we grow in knowledge, what happens to our faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. So as we grow in knowledge, our faith is going to grow, and as our faith grows, then our access to God's grace, our access to God's favor, grows as well. So what he's telling us to do in verse 18 is what he's already laid out in chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Grow. We need to grow spiritually. What was important to the apostle Peter? Think with me about the last words that were given to Peter by the Lord. I mean, personally. In John chapter 21, what did Jesus say? Feed my sheep. And what is Peter doing? To his dying breath, he is making sure the sheep are fed. What's on Peter's mind? What's important to him? That Christians safeguard themselves against the threat of false teachers by growing in their knowledge of God's Word. Those were Peter's famous last words. It wouldn't be fair to talk about Peter without talking about Paul, would it? So let's talk about Paul. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy. We're, we are confident that 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote, his last contribution to the New Testament, which is quite large. As I'm helping Karen... She and I are, are taking turns teaching one of the classes down the hallway, and I, I like to ask the students there, if I ask them to turn to a book of the Bible, I like to ask, well, who wrote this book? And if it's in the New Testament, they've learned in class that it's, it's a pretty safe guess to say Paul, because he's, he's written quite a few of those letters, and I've showed them how they can know for sure if it was written by Paul. Paul contributed a lot to the New Testament. And we learn a lot about the life of Paul, not only as we study through the book of Acts, but then as we study the epistles that he wrote, and we take the comments that he makes about his personal experiences, and we lay all those out. Paul lived an incredible life. And he went through an enormous amount. And so when he comes to the end of this letter, and he writes in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, we find ourselves almost cheering for Paul, don't we? He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Yes, you have, Paul. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Way to go, Paul. And we're excited for Paul. We're happy for Paul because he has suffered a lot to get this but he didn't write this for himself. He wrote this for us. Not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. As we read Paul's famous last words, they are an encouragement to you and I to remain faithful. Paul is facing the reality of his approaching death. It's going to happen. When we were studying the book of Philippians, it might happen, it might not. He didn't know. Now he knows it's going to happen. He's going to die, but he has some confidence here. He has confidence because he's been faithful to the end. He has fought the good fight. He has finished the race. He has kept the faith. And he knows that when the race is over, then the victor is crowned. And he's looking forward to this crown of righteousness. This crown of righteousness is not a diadem. That is, it's not a ruling crown that's put upon the head of a king. That's what Solomon would have gotten. This is a, a wreath, a laurel, that was placed on the Olympic champion after he won his competition. And that crown of righteousness, that, that victor's crown, is given to all of us if we will fight the good fight, if we will finish the race, if we will keep the faith. Now this, this crown of righteousness, I want to pause right here, this crown of righteousness 
is not a reward that is given in addition to heaven. This is not something that you can get if you're really serious about serving the Lord, like Paul was. Then you can expect not just to get to heaven, but when you get to heaven, you're going to get a crown. There's this idea of levels of, of reward in heaven that people have, and that's not taught anywhere in the Scriptures. Heaven, you're either in or you're out. That's what the Bible teaches about heaven. But, but here's where this idea comes from. If you're ever studying with anyone who believes in once saved, always saved, then, then they will go to a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the, the last couple verses of this chapter, <clears throat> where Paul says, Thus, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. You see, we point out to them, Paul, there was a real danger of Paul being disqualified. Well, yes, they'll come back and say, yes, he's in danger of being disqualified from winning this crown. But he's not in danger of, of being disqualified of eternal life. The Bible makes no distinction. No such distinction at all. But when you believe a false doctrine, that's the kind of corner you're backed into. The Bible uses all different kinds of figures to represent the same truth. We get heaven. And getting a crown of righteousness is one of those figures that is used. Again, you're, you're either in or you're out. But what Paul is, is doing here, if we can come back to the text, Paul has confidence. Paul has confidence. I know what I've done, and I know what God has promised me, and I know that I've got it. I've got it. And why does he have this confidence? Because he has confidence in the one who's giving the gift, who's giving the crown. The New American Standard Version renders 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 in this way. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. I am convinced that God is able. I've done my part, and I know that God is going to do his. Heaven is available to everyone. But only those who finish the race in faith will have heaven, will have that crown of righteousness. What was important to Paul, what was on his mind as his life was drawing to an end, making sure that everyone fought the good fight of faith, everyone finished the race, and everyone won the crown of righteousness. That's what mattered to Paul. Now finally, let's look at our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mason read for us the account of the Great Commission from Mark's Gospel. I want to read it in the more familiar text, and that is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, we have words from Jesus after His ascension into heaven. We can read those in the book of Acts. We can read those in the book of Revelation. But I want us to consider these as his famous last words. These are the words that he said before he left this world. These really are the apostles' marching orders. The book of Acts is a fulfillment of this passage right here. And everything that we do in trying to seek and save the lost is a perpetuation of these last words right here. These are famous last words. This is what we call the Great Commission. Allow me for just a moment to consider why this is the Great Commission. This is the Great Commission because it was given with the greatest authority. Jesus, before He commissioned the apostles, He said, all authority 
has been given to me. Not some. All authority is given to me. Go and make disciples. And so you and I today, as we go to make disciples, as we seek and save the lost, we are doing so by the authority of Christ. As we evangelize, as we attempt to proselytize, what do I mean by that? I mean by trying to talk to people who are in a religious belief and trying to talk them out of that and coming to the Lord's church. You know, in our ecumenical world that we live in today, that is anathema to suggest that one group, one person in one group over here isn't saved and they need to come out of that and be a part of our group over here. You can't be doing that today. So says the world. But our Lord and Savior says, do it. And so as we are battling for the souls of those people around about us, and we are trying to bring them out of religious error, we do so with the authority of Christ. It is all authoritative. The Great Commission is great because it is the greatest in scope. Go make disciples of all the nations. The gospel is for everyone. No one is ruled out. It is great because it meets the greatest need. Again, Mark's account, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's our greatest need. Jesus didn't come to this world so we would have a couple of holidays. Jesus didn't come to this world so that just to show us what love is. Jesus came to this world to address our greatest need, our sin. And the gospel addresses that need. And it is great because it has the greatest promise. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus was with the apostles in a very special way as they went out and carried out this great commission. But he continues to be with us as we strive to follow his commands. And the last command he gave was go and make disciples. The Lord is going to be with us and help us and give us what we need in order to carry out that command. This is the Great Commission. These are our Lord's final words. What was important to Jesus? As He left this world, what was important to Jesus was making sure that you and I had an opportunity to hear the gospel. Making sure that you and I could be saved. That's what was important to Jesus. You know, famous last words. As I said, that, that, that's an idiom that we use in our language to refer to, yeah, just, let's just wait and see how this turns out. Uh, but we also understand that, that when somebody knows that these are the last words they're going to have to say to somebody, those words are worth hearing. And those words are worth remembering. It was over a year and a half ago that I stood by my dad's bed and held his hand and said, I love you, Dad. And the last words I ever heard him say were, I love you too. And the next day he breathed his last. That was it. We've all experienced things like that, and we're going to experience more things like that. Those last words are important. We hang on to those. You know, the Bible is full of last words. And it would do us well when we know we're reading those last words to stop and to learn some lessons from them. Joshua, David, Peter, Paul, our Lord, they all had important lessons to teach with those last words. Well, let's learn those lessons. If you're here and you're not yet a Christian, not yet a child of God, did you notice what was important here? Joshua, what was important to him was the next generation serving God. What was important to David, that his son have a right relationship with God. Peter, that you remain faithful to God. Paul, you fight the good fight of faith, you see it through to the end. Our Lord, that you have an opportunity to come to heaven, to hear the gospel, to obey it, and come to heaven. If you're not yet a Christian, you need to become one. That's what the Bible calls out to you to do. To become a Christian, to serve Him faithfully. If you believe Jesus is the Son of God, then respond to that in the proper way. 
by repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and being baptized in water to have those sins washed away. And you can rise from that burial of baptism to walk in newness of life. Maybe you've done that in the past, but you've stumbled. You've stumbled. You, you've turned away from the Lord. Or you've allowed sin to come into your life in such a way that you need to take care of it in a public way. The invitation is for you. Maybe you're overwhelmed and you would like our prayers on your behalf with, with spiritual matters, with problems in your life. We'd be glad to pray with you. Whatever your spiritual need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song.